connected with the rededication and the reopening of Fort Allen Park. Um, I was up there late this afternoon just to take a quick look at the new work there, uh, and it's really splendid. I know many of you are already familiar with it, and you can see me tomorrow as well with the special ceremony up there. I think that uh, the work really reflects both the foresight of people in the late 19th and early 20th century, particularly people like James and Baxter, in preserving open spaces in Portland, and certainly their vision has played out uh, into the 21st century, uh, and what we have is, is really a tremendous treasure up there. Uh, tonight, um, it's my pleasure to moderate um, a forum, a symposium, uh, on the War of 1812 period, as well as commentary on the restoration of the park. Uh, by the way, my name is Earl Shuttleworth, uh, and among my hats, I'm the state historian. Uh, and I also grew up in Portland. Uh, I want to say, too, that it's a thrill to be having this program uh, here in the Jewish Heritage Museum. Uh, this is the last uh, intact uh, historic synagogue uh, on the Portland Peninsula. Uh, and it's really thrilled to see how beautifully it's been restored. Uh, and it really is a great historic uh, space uh, for people to gather in. Um, tonight, um, I have the pleasure of uh, bringing to your attention uh, three wonderful speakers. The first is uh, historian uh, George Dorn. And uh, I had the pleasure of meeting him just a few minutes ago. Um, he has a PhD in American History and Government from Harvard. Um, he holds the 2008 Samuel Elliott Morrison uh, Award for Naval Literature. Uh, he's a distinguished professor at the Air Force Academy, Wesleyan University, Connecticut College, and Harvard. And George tells me that a few years ago, he undertook to create a trilogy of three books dealing with the naval history of the War of 1812, which was a very much overlooked part of our American history, but one that Portland has been here tonight certainly played important roles in. First book, If I See, the second, The War of 1812, and the third, The Shining Sea. And he's going to share with us uh, his knowledge of uh, the War of 1812 uh, and its uh, naval ramifications both in Portland and beyond. George. Superb 
uh, captain, and uh, they were very happy to be rid of him, but at the same time, they wanted to uh, pay tribute to him. And this is what they said about uh, Henry Allen. Sacred to the memory of William Henry Allen, aged 27, late commander of the United States Brig Argus, who died August 18, 1813, in consequence of a wound received in action with HBM Brig Pelican. August 14, 1813. Also in remembrance of Richard Delfrey, midshipman, age 18 years, U.S. Navy, killed in the same action, whose remains are deposited uh, here. And then at the end, here sleep the brave. This is uh, the, the British tribute to uh, uh, Henry Allen. Um, he was uh, Stephen Decatur's first lieutenant uh, aboard uh, the uh, U.S. frigate of the United States uh, in 1812 when they defeated the Macedonian uh, unexpectedly uh, in one of the great naval battles of the War of 1812, and at the end of it, Decatur uh, attributed his victory to Henry Allen and uh, his, his superb gunner. And uh, Decatur then, after repairing the Macedonian, uh, gave, it, gave command of the Macedonian to Henry Allen, and the two of them brought the ships back to the United States. And when they got close uh, to New York, Decatur decided that he would go into New London and, and Henry Allen would go into uh, Narragansett Bay and to Newport. Uh, Henry Allen came from Rhode Island and Decatur wanted him to get a uh, hometown welcome. Uh, uh, and so Henry Allen brought the uh, brought the Macedonian into Narragansett Bay and into Newport. This was the first uh, and really the only American uh, 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 to bring a captured enemy warship into an American, uh, American port uh, during, the, uh, during the war. The, the head of the, the uh, naval station in Newport right then was all the hazard power. Uh, and you've probably heard of him. And Perry also was a young man and very ambitious. And he was, he was uh, very jealous of the fact that he was sitting there in Newport not having any action in his Henry, Henry Allen bring the Macedonian. Uh, uh, and, and this is what uh, got Perry going and finally got himself back into action in Lake Erie later on. Uh, and um, and uh, you probably know some of the history, uh, some of the history of, uh, of that. Uh, now Henry Allen became a, a, uh, a midshipman in the United States Navy because his family uh, was, was uh, a military family. And this was true of all of the uh, officers, nearly all of the officers who, who were in the United States Navy during the War of 1812. This was the, probably the finest group of officers ever to serve uh, 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 in the Navy, the few young men who served in the War of 1812. Uh, and Henry, Henry Allen's father had, had served in the American Army from the day after Lexington conquered until Yorktown, the whole entire, the whole entire war. Stephen Decatur's family uh, had also had a distinguished uh, background uh, uh, there. And I mention this because uh, the War of 1812 was, was very peculiar in the sense that 
the United States had 20 warships. 20. We were a country of 8 million. Uh, we had 20 warships. The British had 1,000. Uh, of the 20, 14 of them were serviceable. Uh, the the uh, officers who served in the Navy were people who uh, served all during the administration of Jefferson and the first, uh, the first uh, administration of Madison. Presidents who were opposed to the Navy, they fought against the Navy their entire uh, political career. And what was interesting to me about the War of 1812, one of the interesting things, was the U.S. Navy played a huge role in winning the war uh, for, uh, for us. Uh, and it was this, this group of officers who stayed through uh, this period of time uh, uh, that uh, were so, so important in the War of 1812. Henry, Henry Allen, for instance, and Stephen Decatur started in the Navy uh, under President Madison uh, in, in the Quasi War with France, which was from 1798 to, uh, to 1800. Uh, Henry Allen started as a a midshipman, and, and Stephen Decatur uh, also started as a midshipman. But they also served in the uh, uh, war against Tripoli, uh, which was 1801 to 1805. Then they stayed in the Navy uh, and were available for the War of 1812. Why did they stay in the Navy? They stayed in it because that was the tradition of their family uh, and because their patriotism was immense. Uh, I get, I get uh, kidded sometimes about emphasizing all the patriotism of this. Of course, if you're a military man, you can't, patriotism only carries you so far. But, but uh, uh, patriotism was a factor, uh, and it was a factor for these, uh, uh, for these men. Uh, let me just tell you very quickly uh, why the Navy was so important. The Navy was so important in the war because it started in June of 1812. It ended in February of 1815. And up until uh, September of 1814, the United States was doing very badly uh, in the war. Our army had been doing uh, 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 very poorly. Uh, and uh, because of this, and because the British, had fun British and her allies had finally defeated Napoleon, uh, in, in April of uh, 1814, the British decided that they were going to invade the United States in April of 1814 and settle with us once and for all. And they were mad as hell at us because we had declared war on them way back in June of 1812, just when Napoleon was invading Russia. They thought Napoleon was going to conquer Russia and then turn on them. Uh, so did the whole world. It didn't work out that way. But they remembered uh, that we stabbed them in the back and so in, in uh, April of 1814, when Napoleon finally was deposed, uh, they were going to turn on, on the United States, and they did turn on the United States, and they, they invaded us from Canada. This was their plan, invade from Canada, invade from the south through New Orleans, and then conduct amphibious raids all along the coast of the United States. And if you looked in Maine, and knew anything about Maine history, you would know that they did plenty along the Maine coast, and that was true. They, they harassed the towns all the way down the Atlantic coast, all the way to Florida. Uh, every, a lot of towns in Maine have stories about uh, when, the, uh, when the British came, and there were stories from little towns all the way down uh, our coast. One of these raids was the raid on Washington in, in August, on August 24th, this was a big one, uh, and you know that they, they succeeded and burned our, our capital. But, but, uh, and the British, when they were burning the capital, they thought, well, we're going to have an easy time with this member in the United States, which is what they intended to do. But two weeks later, the United States stopped the invasion from Canada. Who did it? It was the Navy, this twin ship Navy, which by that time had 26 ships. <laughs> and it was a fellow named McDonough that, uh, that did it and won a victory in Plattsburgh and, and, and uh, uh, over a superior British fleet and that stopped the invasion. The, the, commander, the British commander 
of the ground force of over 10,000, the biggest uh, uh, army on the continent. He turned around and went back to Canada because he needed control of, of, uh, of Lake Champlain. Two weeks later, the same British force that burned Washington turned on Baltimore. Baltimore was a different category. Baltimore was ready. Washington wasn't. And they stopped them at Baltimore. This big British invasion force had to turn around and, uh, and leave. And because of this, when news of this got back to, to London, the British people all of a sudden turned against the war against the United States. They weren't so mad anymore. You know why? Because they didn't want a long, prolonged war. They were delighted after the Green Washington because they thought it would be quick. But when they found out, well, maybe this is going to be like the revolution in the war for years, we don't want to be part of it. You know why? Because they had been fighting the French since 1793. <laughs> <laughs> they all of a sudden developed war fatigue. And the British at that time were led by a wonderful prime minister named Liverpool, who was a politician uh, ahead of his time. Uh, and uh, Liverpool followed public opinion. Of course, he never admitted that, but he did. And so when opinion turned, he turned and settled uh, with the United States. And a peace treaty was signed um, on December 24, uh, 1814. Then the Battle of New Orleans takes place after the peace treaty in January, uh, on January 8, 1815. And this was important because uh, because uh, the the uh, the prime minister and, it, and the next most powerful member of the cabinet named Castlereagh, they took a look at look at the Orleans and they put together with Baltimore and Plattsburgh and some other things and they said you know the United States is very strong. It's a much different country than it was in June of 1812. And uh, if we don't change our policy towards them. We're going to be fight, fighting them over one thing and another for, for the next hundred years. Uh, and they were right. And so the war changed the whole relationship between the two great English-speaking countries. And a hundred years later, uh, and we're celebrating the life the centennial of the beginning of the, of the World War, this great war, we find these two countries allied at a certain point. And, and I ask people, if we had been fighting with them, since 1814, for instance, over the boundary of Canada. Think of how many wars that could have created, just arguing about that. If we had been fighting with them all of this time, uh, do you think we would have come together in World War I? I think it would have been pretty difficult. So the coming together of these two uh, great, the great English-speaking countries that was so important uh, in the 20th, 20th century and still is important, who's flying with us over, over Iraq as we speak? Uh, who's with us? Uh, that, that great partnership uh, began here as a consequence of the War of 1812, and, and because uh, we had become stronger militarily, also politically, than we, been, uh, than we had been in the United States Navy, played a very big part in that, and, and uh, Lieutenant Allen was, was a very big part of, uh, of that. So this, this Fort Allen has been very well, very well made. That's my time. Yeah. You said earlier that we're, we're going to uh, hold questions until uh, all three speakers have had their say, uh, but then uh, feel free to ask questions at that time. It's now my pleasure to introduce to you someone who I'm sure many of you know, uh, Herb Adams. Uh, Herb has variously been an actor, a historian, a journalist, a college professor, and uh, has been a distinguished member of the main House of Representatives for eight terms, uh, and is uh, trying to work on a ninth. <laughs> I must say, I really feel like the brown shoes in the tuxedo of the panel uh, this evening. <laughs> to be present with such distinguished uh, company 
as the historians that you're going to hear from tonight. But I thought you'd like to know how our fellow townsmen looked upon the uh, dedication of Fort Allen 200 years ago almost to this very night. Two dedications took place that night, that day. The first on a fort at the lower edge of the cliff that makes Fort Allen. Today vanished underneath the Eastern Prom uh, walking trail, which was dubbed Fort Lawrence in honor of Captain James Lawrence. Don't give up the ship, Lawrence, that fellow. It is, if they wrote, a substantial and handsome marine battery calculated for 10, 24, or 32 pounders, so named for the size and weight of the spear of iron that they would fire. The general made a short and appropriate address on the occasion, and when the name was announced amid the hearty cheers of a numerous concourse of citizens, the new and commanding battery above was greeted with cheers, and the colors were raised. The same was repeated for the battery above, which was named by Captain John Lewis, Fort Allen, with the same ceremonies. This work is of a semicircular form and substantially uh, cut to contain eight guns. It has been completed in the course of 20 days. Built in 20 days, and it's lasted 200 years. It was in 20 days by fatigue parties from the detached militia, who were led by Captain Lewis and other defenders of our city, notably the Portland Sea Fencibles. Those were the militia, and were drawn from uh, uh, working upon uh, vessels. The public are more indebted to Mr. James Deary, the squire, and any other individual uh, for the money and the means to complete Fort Allen, this edifice of the family that eventually gave Deering Oaks uh, to Portland. Who, uh, we would say to such uh, those of you who scold and fret and prowl about and complain that nothing has been done, and you go contribute, and you do likewise. Should this remark irritate certain gentlemen over the knuckles, then that is all right, because he has done more for us and the defense of our town than many other individuals, than some who are worth more than $100,000 at least. He who will not give a little to secure the whole is not worthy to be defended, and much uh, to him in times like these, he is barely worthy to be called a good citizen. <laughs> you know what editorials like that much anymore? <laughs> At least not twice. In the <laughs> Today, what we call the Eastern Prom and Fort Allen, at that moment, up to that time, was woody, ragged, and at the edge, short of place. It's not a park, it's not a destination at all. Long before the War of 1812, the site there was the place where the city pest house was placed. Now it's not for annoying people. The pest house is for dying people and the dead. Pestilence, it is where you put your smallpox victims and other places and people who are not likely to be recovering. A quarantine hospital, Portland's own Hotel California. You can check in any time you want, but you can never leave. <laughs> Notably, tomorrow morning, starting our ceremonies at the uh, POW graves that were just outside that hospital. These are all American POWs who were captured in the Battle of Queenston, Canada, in 1812, put ashore to die slowly of ship diseases there. A dreadful thing to be buried in a trench with no name above you. Tomorrow, we will honor them and then walk to Fort Allen. Now, Allen, of course, is a promontory, was then too. It had a uh, commanding reach from uh, the highest part of the promenade there. Of the entire entrance to Casco Bay and to Portland Harbor was built for military necessity, as we have heard, and named for Lieutenant Henry Allen, William Henry Allen. He was 28 years old when he captained the Argus. Um, um, young, ambitious, contentious, eager, 
brash on deck, bashful in person. He never said what his heart felt to a certain young lady in Providence, Rhode Island, who was waiting for it, who waits still. <laughs> he never said those words to her. So he has no living descendants today. This fort and a short street in New York City is all that remains of Allen's name now. Now, Fort Allen never actually fired on the foe. The war was over, actually, five months later, after it was dedicated, January uh, and February 1815, as Mr. Don has so well pointed out to us. It was a cold and miserable place to spend the winter. I have brought a book, which you're welcome to look at uh, afterwards, of a set of articles I discovered, uh, written 75 years later, reminiscences about the defenses of Portland in the year 1814, soldier stories by a man who's something like uh, Mr. Shuttleworth, who went around and interviewed the last of them all. It was transcribed by Mr. Larry Platt, the authority of the War of 1812. And I have that book here. You're welcome to look at it. They pulled hijinks just as you would expect soldiers. <laughs> it enters now a period of sort of a romantic ruin of sorts. Guns were kept there for a time, the 24 and 32 pounders. Young Henry Wadsworth Longfellow loved to come up and ramble and down the, uh, the embattlements of the shore as they grass in and lie quietly in the long grass of the old gun embrasures, listening to the, the waves of the gulls. As he wrote years later, the thoughts of youth are long, long thoughts. So the thoughts of the city. In 1836, it occurs to the city of Portland that you might take Fort Allen and link it to other parts of uh, Portland by making what they call a breathing space. That is, uh, it is a very popular subject these days of a mall, a park, or a promenade, um, as they wrote. And the author of this article <coughs> says, the other extremity of our city, if one site must be secured, to my mind presents the strongest inducement of a location altogether surpassing any other in New England. I would therefore suggest this location and advise that a good road, eight rods in width, be laid out commencing from the terminus of Washington Avenue with the bridge and following the various curves and indentations of Mount Joy, Mount Joy Hill, um, and making a promontory of unsurpassed beauty that the old site of Fort Burroughs and Fort Allen distance of one to a, a one and a half miles. This could probably be called Washington Park Promenade. And on account of its unrivaled uh, scenery as magnificently, magnificently presented, the refreshing breezes of Casco Bay and the retirement from the noise and dust of the city would in some embrace, both embrace the objects of the promenade and arrive with probably more acceptance to the public and less expense to the city than any less desirable location in the heart of the town. Now, all that is by way of proposing very close to what we know today, even almost the name, Washington Avenue, yes, and a promenade. And the city undertook to link the fort to these other places by a road. In 1837, I brought a copy of the advertisement that appeared in the Portland Eastern Argus. Argus is the Greek word for I, hence the ship. Argus was an I, hence the newspaper. The newspaper was a lot crabbier than the ship. <laughs> the Eastern Argus in June 19, 1837 has here the advertisement for the road makers who can apply to the political leaders of the city for the privilege of making this road. Uh, for those who understand how politics work, you will all be smiling to know that the next advertisement down is for pork. <laughs> <laughs> now it's interesting to know, and for us in the future years, the Eastern Promenade does reach from Washington Avenue down the slope to Fourth Street, just what this proposes. And Fort Allen was, in fact, embraced. The Eastern Argus remains grumpy. It's a working man's paper. It's gritty and it's blunt, and it says in 1837, oh, great views, but they'll do no good to nine-tenths of our citizens, no benefit at all, or a great ground for the favored few with the coach and four and not to do, like to drive about. 
<laughs> but it's an old argument. It's eternal in governing a city. What is useful versus what is beautiful? What does it cost? What is it worth? Eventually, the Argus uh, does come around. We say nothing about the expediency of the expenditure. That would be no sense talking about it now, they say. But the drive is what every Portlander has reason to be proud of. We wish some of our friends who are apt at describing beautiful scenery would furnish us with a description of the sublime and beautiful <coughs> prospect from this new public improvement. We do know that in the year 1847, some people did drive out there. President James K. Polk visited Portland, Maine, and he's the first president I know of to actually go to Port Allen. Went there on a Saturday, he did not travel on a Sunday. <laughs> president James Monroe who visited Portland in 1817, climbed the observatory tower, I think might have gone to Port Allen. He certainly went to Port Prevost. And in 1924, the Marquis de Lafayette did visit Portland, did go to the tower, and did at least drive around what would later become the Eastern Promenade. But President Polk was there, and with him, James Buchanan, the Secretary of State, later President himself. Polk is one of the least known but most successful American presidents, annexed Texas, won the Mexican War. Buchanan is little remembered because he was one of the most unsuccessful presidents, who <laughs> twiddled his thumbs while the Civil War was coming. It's the only time that I can find where two United States presidents went to Port Allen at the same time. Uh, one a successful unknown, and the other a forgotten dub. <laughs> <laughs> Portland settles for nothing in between. <laughs> we do know that in 19, August 1902, President Theodore Roosevelt did come to Portland, Maine, and did, with his horse and carriage, take a tour down through uh, Port Allen. He did stay to take in the view. He is probably the first, and may indeed be the only, president who could look at that port and look at that view and know of a certainty the ship, the battle, and the man it referred to. Because in his youth, he had been the author of a still fine book, The Naval War of 1812. Now, during the Civil War, there's no real regular watch that I can detect from the newspapers of the time that was kept up at Fort Allen. Uh, the militia drilled upon its slopes of uh, the hill. Portland was really defended, however, by Fort Scammell, Fort Preble, and Fort Gorgeous, then being built in 1858 to 1864. All of them failed us. Every one of them failed us in June 1863 when rebel raiders slipped into Portland Harbor and stole the United States Revenue Cutter Caleb Cushing and got it out past Portland Headlight for uh, getting uh, pursued by a posse and blowing it off. The cannon that stand at uh, Port Allen today are Civil War surplus distributed after the war for generations by United States congressmen. I believe the Thomas Bracken Reed has something to do with the king, the ones that are there, but they did not stand there during the war. President Bush the first, President Clinton the only, and they did stop, <laughs> but they didn't leave us account of what they saw. But what we love and enjoy every day, they were able to see. You know, and in fact, might not have been able to see it. Certain folks had their way back in the year 1890. The city did not outrightly own all of Fort Allen and the immediate land about it. Plans were announced to build a summer hotel on the site, which would have been the first house, grand hotel built on the water side of the promenade, would never have been the last if one had been built. So how different the views would have been. But our city government purchased the site outright and made it an extension of the promenade. And now we are up to the point of our modern day where President Polk and Buchanan roll out, and the friends of the Eastern Prom roll in. <laughs> other hands and other dreamers roll in to make Port Allen the place we know and love today. You know, to conclude, I don't believe that young 28-year-old Lieutenant William Henry Allen ever saw the post of me. I don't think he ever saw this city. He certainly never saw the highland which holds his name. But it holds his fame, 
and it holds its beauty, and it proves the truth of Longfellow's poem of so many years ago to all of us who go there and take in the view and our private thoughts. The boy's will is the wind's will, and the thoughts of youth are long, long, Um, you can see the road that was uh, placed around the very 
different. And, and the other thing about this image that I think is really striking is inspiring to me is you notice what's growing along that road on the palm are the trees. Yeah. 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 Y
the town streets and stood along uh, the prom. And the, one of the striking images here for us as designers where, where it was the fact that what you see here is the trees are really lining the proms and providing a backdrop through which you walk. And once you get into the park, you have this fabulous view. So it's kind of getting you, um, you know, back to, uh, to meet up against when you're sitting in the park and looking out into the water. And that was the whole idea, was to try to really force people out to look out over the park. To keep the planting in the park below so that you can see out. Other features that were added in the 1890s were the cobblestone gutters, which we've returned to the park. And a lot of ornamental plantings, again low, so they would preserve the view, but also give the um, park some character. <laughs> and as I mentioned, the elm trees stood on the palm and provided that strong edge. Next. In 1896, and this is when the terraces were built that had become the popular viewing spot, and my old boyfriend from college who grew up in Cumberland and still lives there. Um, told me that he used to take his girlfriends during high school to make out. Anyway, so the the wrought iron fencing that um, was uh, was originally put in the late 1890s, and it began with the lower terrace fencing, which is the and then later the upper terrace fencing. And it's beginning in 1896, that's when the steps were started, were begun to be built in between the two uh, terraces. Now, people a lot of times ask me about the use of concrete. You know, we think of it as kind of a modern material. Well, wow. nobody used concrete back then. But actually, around the turn of the century, concrete was considered a very, very fashionable um, kind of formal material. So it's not unusual that the walks in the park were made out of concrete and also the terraces. Yeah. As heard mentioned, the rod and cannons were brought to the park from 1900. And as you saw in that earlier image, um, they were located on top of the berms and eventually put onto these carriages. Okay. So uh, after uh, the initial construction of the park, uh, the park actually took up a little bit smaller piece of space. So in, in this image here, you can see the promenade. And in uh, 1899, what can you see here on the promenade? What, what does the ownership of the land look like here? It's all divided up, right? And there are actually some you know, private homes that are on what we think of as promenade park land. The mayor, who was elected in 1892, was very concerned about the extent of private ownership. I think largely because he really foresaw that this could be a great public amenity and we would never be sorry. This is kind of how Frederick Olmsted viewed Central Park. If you don't reserve that land for the public now, it eventually will be gone. And then you will not be able to you know, have a spectacular type of amenity in the public. So, uh, he began, and the city began advocating, he began advocating, and the city began purchasing land along the pond from the private owners. Now, in the very right lower part of this image, you can see a pale blue colored square, and that's the original Fort Edward Park. So it was narrower, it basically was what we think of as the horseshoe area today. That was the original park But it expanded. Um, in 1904, uh, um, I mentioned Fred Wickle Olmsted. Baxter um, had made a deal to swap some land so he was able to um, expand the, uh, the promenade in the park. And he also engaged the Olmsted Brothers firm to come in and do a whole plan for the promenade. And this is the plan that they did here. Fred Olmsted was not in the picture at that point, but his sons were. And as you can see, way down in the right hand corner, lower right hand corner, there's where the car um, kind of wedged into that little piece of um, property. Uh, in the first decades of the 20th century, we have these fabulous layers of trees along the colonnade. And you'll notice in this image that on the right side of the palm, there were double rows of trees, and on the left, overlooking the water, a single row. In 1911, 
very involved process. Uh, many, many citizens weighed in, which was great. You have all of the input. Some people kind of do it on their own to even develop their own ideas. You may recognize some people from photos. Um, we did a model of the park so you could kind of look at it all different views at different times of the year. And then next. What we came up with, I think, was um, you know, a design that really captured a lot of those old features that were lost in you know, first in the 30s and then in the 1980s um, and made the place uh, one that could be enjoyed by more people in different ways. So, for example, one of the main things that we did was to reinstitute these long linear walkways for the neighborhood, introduce lighting along them, low lighting so it doesn't light the nice sky, but Hopefully, someone's been out in a boat, they can see what that looks like from the water. That's what I want to do. Um, you'll notice that all the memorials are connected now by walkways. And that was something the city very much wanted. I think that really, um, I was up there last week with my husband, and um, we just, it was great to be able to just walk between them and not be walking on the wet grass. And um, it, you're kind of pulled from one to the other. Also, the cobblestone gutter is back. Next. The plantings, um, I have to give Regina a lot of credit for this. She's a real plant person and she did a fantastic planting scheme that I think that you'll love and enjoy for a long time. Next. One of my uh, favorite parts of this was the return of the original fence. Um, I had to reconstruct that from the photo, uh, give it to a fantastic metal foundry, and they were able to build it. Um, it is uh, steel, it is galvanized, fully galvanized, so it should last for many, many, many years. And of course, we returned a lot of seating that was taken out. The new steps, they are granite. And we've had fantastic, fantastic Mason working on this whole project, but he really did a better job on these. If you've kind of gone to see the steps, they're really quite special. Um, and then we have them recreate the granite posts that were there anchoring the fence uh, throughout. And again, an example, this is the 9-11 memorial, if any people remember from that. Uh, it was a little obstructed before, there were large tall landings in the view, and we took those down and rearranged everything, so when you sit in the memorial, you can actually see up the water. Hmm. And so, um, you know, I'm hoping um, that this will be a long-lasting place that people will be able to enjoy forever, just the way the city wanted to have people enjoy it. In uh, the end of the 19th century, they were calling this spot of the commanding city view and this proved one of the most popular resorts in our city in the summer months, and I hope that that remains true. And I hope you all come tomorrow.
on the part of addressing the need for more funds to complete the payment. Um, what are the plans to, to deal with that deficit? I'm not the person to ask that. <laughs> <laughs> There's anybody here to address it. Um, Diane, you have a president. budget that included doing the finishing touches on the landscape, um, the furnishings, if you will. I mean, the city that donated or dedicated about $1.2 million to this project. Um, and that included really the bones of the project, the roadways, the sidewalks, the lighting, uh, the landscape, the benches, the fencing. And we're uh, looking to uh, return the cannons, which we've been able to do uh, by the hair of our chinny chin chin, just in time for tomorrow. Um, and we have, a, like I said, $300 or a $300,000 budget. And we've got about $70,000 um, remaining in that to finish the project with interpretive signage. Um, there's a stretch of wrought iron fencing that needs to be replaced. And we have a recognition program and a public campaign. Uh, for anyone who's interested in supporting that, you can uh, find me at our website, easternpromenade.org. We also have some information at our table out front. Um, and happy to talk to anyone who would like to help us slide into the home stretch and finish the project. Thank you for asking the question. Uh, I want to run the the Arctic campaign monument is there. What relation does that have to Portland uh, or Maine even? Why is there an Arctic monument? Thank you for putting sidewalk to it anyway. It was grassy only before. That's true. The Arctic campaign. Yeah. Yeah, Dan Haley. Yeah, Dan Haley. The Arctic Memorial is to commemorate the convoys which traveled from Portland, Maine into oh, Russia. Start. This is the closest port to Europe. It's also home of the Sixth Fleet during World War II. I think there was 3,300 Virgin Marines that died making the voyage. It was not only uh, perilous because of the enemy, but it was perilous because of the seas. And, uh, the Russians have been over here twice. They've had their ambassador with, uh, toured the area, had great chats with them, brought them down to Boys and Girls Club. And all of them told stories about how their parents were actually saved by those convoys. So it's quite special. And then walking around it just did great justice. Yeah. And, and of course, literally right across the Fall River, right across the harbor, hundreds of Liberty ships were there. Exactly. And they loaded them up and took them out. Which and there's only one Liberty ship left, which is on the west coast. And that was the O'Brien. Was it two? Two. What's uh, that? Oh, uh, well, Jeremy O'Brien and the uh, Brown. Yeah. Okay. <coughs> Any other questions? Okay, um, if not, um, Diane, you, you have a piece of Thank you. 
Tomorrow. So look forward to seeing you all tomorrow.